You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options com. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Um, our, our, our next speaker is uh, a gentleman by the name of Jack Ablin. <clears throat> Many of may, may know Jack or, or have seen Jack on television or, or read articles or maybe even his book. Uh, Jack was, uh, he is the CIO and Chief Investment Officer and founder of Crescent Wealth, uh, which is based here in Chicago and West Palm Beach. Uh, Jack, prior to, to the two years, he's put this firm together and over $3 billion in assets and more than 50 employees. He was the CIO at Harris Bank across the street. And uh, he is well regarded uh, in this industry uh, across many circles. And so with that, I'd like for you to please give a warm welcome to Jack Ablin. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you for the invitation. Welcome to Chicago. Actually, I just arrived here this morning myself. Um, I thought it was going to be a little nicer. Um, anyway, um, so what I'd like to do is really share with you uh, this notion of goals-based investing. I, how many of you all have heard about goals-based investing? Okay. You have. <laughs> um, well, goals-based investing uh, really crossed my radar screen probably about, I don't know, five or six years ago. And um, what goals-based investing really, the upshot is, given that you're all uh, uh, investment professionals, it's really just immunizing, right? We're just trying to match the assets against the liabilities, in which case it would be our client's lifestyle. Um, and it was fascinating to me um, because it's really just changing the rubric, as I'll describe. Um, we've all tried to get our clients to stick with the program and not get concerned and everything else. And this is really just another way of, of looking at it. Um, but it's a complete system, as I'll describe to you. And um, so anyway, I was at... Uh, BMO uh, across the street. Uh, I was the chief investment officer there for 17 years. I presented the idea of goals-based investing to the leadership team of which I was a part, and it resonated pretty well. Um, if you could go to clients and say, you know, if you give us your cash flows and we can try to match everything in the market, then you'll, in theory, never have to sell anything at a loss. Um, when we started getting into the details, uh, I think that's when my colleagues' faces started to blanch. Uh, one was we had $70 billion of clients and investments who were there with a different premise, right? We, we didn't sell them on goals-based, so they were there for some other reason. Uh, we had a um, myriad of uh, advisors and investment professionals that you know, may adopt goals-based, maybe not. We don't know. Uh, but I think the big kicker was the technology, that the... The commitment that required uh, to really do goals-based and execute it in what I'll call a closed system was pretty much insurmountable for a large bank. Uh, and that's where, uh, and largely just because half of BMO's and I'm sure JP Morgan's and Bank of America's and, and everybody else, Goldman Sachs, half of their technology budget is non-discretionary. They have to respond to what the re regulators are requiring them to do to keep track of the ongoing uh, regulations. Um, and so from that perspective, um, you know, I kind of stored that away. And when this opportunity to help create Crescent came up, that was my first thing. I said, well, we have to be a goals-based investment firm. And you know, lo and behold, we had the advantage of a, a clean slate and we had a large technology budget and really smart technology people. But I think my, the reason why I'm excited to present it to uh, a group like you as RIAs is because I believe 
Goals-based investing, not only is it where, the, where I believe the puck is going uh, for wealth management, but it also gives you and we as RIAs a huge advantage over the bulge bracket um, private banks who would have to turn themselves inside out to try to deliver uh, goals-based. So let me go through my uh, talk with you and I'm happy to address any questions that you have. So let's start with, uh, here we go. Okay, that's me, all right. All right, here we go, goals-based investing. Um, so what we learned is that uh, goals matter, um, and, and the problem is there's this continual tug of war, this, this paradox, if you will, uh, between what clients want. Uh, they want stability, they want predictability uh, in their goals and lifestyle, and yet they're funding this predictability and uh, uh, predictability and, and tranquility, if you will, with something that's completely unpredictable and volatile. Uh, and so there's this continuous, continual tug of war. And in fact, I will say, I suffered this really firsthand probably when I was a trader in uh, 1987. Uh, when my entire screen went red and the market dropped by 30%, feeling completely helpless. Um, and I remember vowed to say, I've got to figure out a way to create some kind of circuit breakers, uh, some kind of downside risk protection in, in this environment. And so that really what helped me set, kind of embark, if you will, on a whole career of figuring out ways to insulate my clients uh, from the vagaries of the market. And by the way, for any of you who want to copy of these slides, well, just give me your business card or something, or want to get our research, just give me your business card and I'll make sure to include you. So, um, so I started in macro and um, um, you know, big picture macro with circuit breakers. Uh, we can talk about that. Um, but the bottom line is this is where I think things are going now. So when it comes to um, investing, the problem is because the markets make investors nervous, nervous investors tend to make flawed decisions. What I'm showing you here is the American uh, Association of Individual Investors bullish bearish uh, sentiment survey. I look at bulls, uh, bulls divided by bulls plus bears and then just do a percentile ranking. And what I find is that those circles on the bottom tend to be the top and bottom decile of that range. And you can see we hit a bottom decile in uh, uh, October or so of this year. Um, and then the subsequent one-year return of the S total return of the S&P 500. So you can see the high circles tend to correspond to low returns. The low circles tend to correspond to high returns. Uh, in fact, if we run this out, you see that uh, if you were to invest in the S&P when investors were wildly bearish on average, the return is, what, what is that, 13.1 on an annual basis. If instead you invest only when investors are wildly bearish in the bottom decile of that historical range, you can see the return in the market is roughly half that um, as a starting point. So, um, so clearly investor sentiment over short periods of time not only um, tends to upset um, investor returns, uh, but it also actually turns out to be a pretty good indicator, a tactical indicator of you know, where you want to uh, uh, position yourself over, say, a one-year period. Um, so it, how, wouldn't it be great if we could insulate our clients uh, from market volatility? Was, ultimately, this is what everybody wants, uh, and if there's just some way we can insulate them from the vagaries of the underlying market. How do we do it? Well, um, 
we start with um, trying to identify uh, what our client's needs and goals are. And essentially, we strip it down uh, from my, for my purpose. Now, we have advisors and we have planners and, and everyone getting into the weeds on needs and wants and everything else. But ultimately, my team gets involved when we have a cash flow series. And so if you could just tell me what your cash flow needs are from now for the next, say, 35 years, every month or every quarter, uh, and you tell me what your assets are, we can then build a portfolio where investments are coming due as your cash flow needs uh, require. Um, but it's part of a longer, that's sort of the upshot, it's part of a longer term process. So what we do is, one is we want to define and prioritize goals. Uh, we need to understand um, our client's uh, financial picture, especially if our clients have jobs and their jobs already are, are funding their lifestyle and they're adding to their portfolio versus maybe they're retiring and they're going to be relying on their portfolio to support their, um, their uh, lifestyle entirely. Um, we then can come up with a probability of, a, of achieving those goals using our assumptions of market returns uh, and what their spending patterns are and so forth. So we have a gauge. It's a number. Uh, and obviously, we want it to be as high as possible. But here's the interesting thing about goals base, as I'll describe it. It's not because our, uh, many of our clients have way more money than they need. And so it isn't necessarily, and I think there's this misconception that this is a tool for you know, those, those investors who are on the bubble, and that they need to figure out ways to save or to spend less or whatever. And in fact, I argue this is really a risk balancing tool. And I had a client here in town uh, when I was at BMO who made a lot of money, came from virtually nothing, and amassed $300 million, and she wanted the entire thing in tax-free, short-term municipal bonds. And we obliged. Um, the problem was we didn't have the tools available to say, you know, by the way, you've locked in your lifestyle five times over. Uh, and would you be just as comfortable if we were to lock in your lifestyle two times over? Uh, and if we were, here's what other money would free up and become available to perhaps put out longer term. So that's kind of what we're trying to do here. It's really more of a framing and it's a risk balancing approach. We then align uh, the investment strategy to meet the cash flow needs as I'll describe and then we will monitor those and have a, we do have a tactical overlay I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. Uh, and then we, when we have an investment review, it's almost like a planning session all over again. We update that percentage. We look at how their spending matches against what they told us their spending was going to be. So that we're, we're gauging them on their end of the bargain, and then they're gauging us on our end of the bargain. I'll describe how we do that. So in a nutshell, what, we, what we've done is we've just changed the dis change the conversation from stocks, bonds, and cash to uh, lifestyle growth and aspirational. Um, and um, so we have three strategies uh, that, that we talk about. But obviously, our first strategy uh, is, is surrounding safety uh, and liquidity and kind of the current paycheck. The second strategy, as I'll describe, is really more market return. And then <clears throat> the third strategy is what we call aspirational. So any questions so far? OK. So let's go into some detail here. So we have three primary strategies. We have a lifestyle strategy uh, that we uh, that we, we put together to match cash flow needs from zero to seven years. Uh, and we use a, a regular optimization. It's a Markowitz-type optimization, but we're maximizing income. 
subject to certain rules. We're maximizing income subject to being able to have a 95% chance of making money over a three-year holding period because we want this to be relatively stable. Now, we're not, we don't use a traditional bell-shaped curve. We are using non-normal distributions, um, so we will take into account skewness and kurtosis. We'll also um, look at um, variable correlations uh, in, really in an effort to try to get a handle on the risk uh, that's embedded here. And as a result, you can see the expected return from that strategy is relatively low, um, but it does have um, you know, the, the ability to generate cash uh, to deliver that paycheck on schedule. Uh, the next strategy, uh, and I'll describe it, um, is um, growth-oriented. That's a seven to 15-year holding period. Um, and um, you know, if you think about taking the S&P um, and holding it for seven, well, if you take a diversified mix of uh, global uh, equities and hold it for seven years, you have something like a 98% chance of making money over that, over that time frame. Um, and so um, that's pretty much how we're kind of oriented that piece. And then what I, I would say probably really unique is this aspirational strategy, 15 years and beyond. So what we've done is we've now taken kind of the back end off and said, is there money in the pool that we don't need to touch for 15 years or more? Sometimes it's a young person that has a job. Other times it's you know, ultra high net worth that's maybe looking past their current spending or perhaps a future generation or charitable. But if you think about it, um, putting a 15-year minimum holding period on investment strategy really liberates you to really open up and find a lot of different ways of gaining access to a lot of different markets, and I can uh, describe those. Um, so let's take a look at the lifestyle strategy. So you know, if we, oh, I'm sorry, this is just kind of a, the, the mix. Let me just see where we are here with this. So you can see generally, uh, let me just see if this is a current one. This is actually an old one because we don't, our, our lifestyle portfolio doesn't have equities in it anymore because we're maximizing income. Um, but um, it's really a, a diversified mix and I'll, I'll go through some, some details there. But it gives you a flavor for where kind of the, the allocations are by, um, by investment time horizon. So let's take a look at the lifestyle strategy. Again, this has a... Uh, 90, I think we have a 96% chance of making money over a three-year holding period. And yeah, this would have a traditional allocation to, uh, you know, a, a Barclays, uh, you know, bond portfolio or tax exempt, but we'll also um, have a, a private component too. So it will invest in equipment leases, music royalties, life insurance settlements, litigation finance, just we're trying to generate uh, reinsurance. We're trying to generate income from a variety of sources uh, so that together we have a pretty good holding period, uh, you know, a three-year holding period return uh, of, of being ahead of the game and have a fair amount of predictability. I think the yield on this portfolio is around 6%. Um, so that's that piece. Um, the next is growth. Uh, I will call that mostly beta. Um, it's very, as you, we all know, it's very difficult to beat the public markets over a seven to 10 year holding period. Um, and so we're not, I mean, we, we could try looking for active managers, but it is, this is a mostly um, public market portfolio, low cost. My preference would be low cost, just beta. Uh, but we will add, um, two components we're looking at adding to this. One is um, private equity secondaries. So we have a fund um, uh, called Flowstone uh, that just uh, invests, uh, makes market in, in private equity limited partnership positions where the holder is trying to get out and we'll, we'll make a, do the due diligence and make a market in it. We then pool that together into uh, a portfolio of private equity partnerships. And historically, uh, well, 
the, the advantage of private equity uh, secondaries is there's no J curve uh, and there's no blind pool and uh, there's no uh, vintage risk because we're building a diversified portfolio of, um, of secondaries. Uh, historically, as an asset class, private equity secondaries uh, has beaten the S&P 500 over long, over 10-year time frames by two full percentage points, about 11.5% versus, say, 9.5%. And they're not just Flowstone, they, uh, but other uh, providers, uh, BlackRock, I think, has one and, and, uh, and others. So that's uh, where that's coming. And the other is um, we have a strategy where we will co look to make direct co-investments with private equity funds. Um, so we won't be part of their fund, but we will co-invest with their fund. Um, and they're in the driver's seat, so they're generally gonna be a seven to outside chance 10-year holding period. Um, so, but the economics are much better if we go in uh, directly, so we don't have to pay um, all, of their, all of their junk charges. Um, and then, and then lastly, aspirational, which I didn't put a, a, a statistical curve out, but think about um, aspirational investing when you, where you have 15 years or more, um, what you can really do. So we buy just direct private equity, so we'll buy companies. Uh, we will buy buildings um, and then divide it up into smaller bite-sized pieces for our clients so that a client can have, say, a portfolio of 10 private companies at $100,000, as small as $100,000 a piece, uh, or 10 uh, real estate. Generally, we do multifamily, low, uh, in both cases, uh, low leverage um, investing, where we're trying to use the cash flow from the underlying investment to generate a dividend uh, for our clients. Um, but those could be 20 year plus. We, we don't have a necessarily a time horizon on, on those holding periods. On the public side, um, we're, looking at, um, um, we're looking at thematic investing. Um, and so again, this is, you know, when you're really looking out 15 years or more, Markowitz and hedging tends to work against you because you've got a long enough time horizon where things are likely gonna move higher so what you really want to do in that case is just try to, you know, obviously look at the best investments, but take on the most risk, because over that period of time, the risk tends to mitigate as, as you, you know, extend your holding period. Um, and so we're looking at thematic investing like cybersecurity. Generally, this is global. Um, robotics and AI, where mo more than half of robotics and artificial intelligence investing is done outside the U.S., regrettably. Um, genomics, um, you know, so those are the kinds of things where we're trying to take more of a position there. And then there are other firms where we can take thematic investments on the private side uh, as well. Okay, so one of the th key pieces to this whole puzzle is you have to keep it as a closed system. If you're gonna describe your investment program in the context of your client goals and, achieve, and, the, and the mission is to achieve those goals, then you have to keep that, um, keep that conversation within the, that context. And so this is one of the biggest impediments um, to, uh, to really running a full goals-based system is goals-based reporting. So we have really four pieces of goals-based, the way I would describe it. Goals-based planning, a goals-based investment policy statement, a goals-based investment program, and then most importantly, a goals-based reporting so that we can show our clients not only how their individual strategies are doing, uh, so uh, this is lifestyle, um, Next one's growth, and then aspirational, but then also update them, are they still on track? Um, and so the most important, you know, we're gonna see 
how has their spending matched what we expected their spending to be, and how has our investment program collectively mapped against what we expected it. That's, I think it's called a funnel chart or an envelope chart where we have the 90th percentile of outcomes and the 10th percentile of outcomes. And then you actually have a real time time series, which is hopefully in between those, and then an updated percentage. Uh, and this work can be done on an ad hoc basis. So for example, if uh, a nervous investor called us you know, in December of last year and said, you know, what's going on? We could literally take a snapshot of their portfolio, run this, and say, you know, that percentage you had, you know, hasn't changed. And so that's really where we're trying to keep that, keep that focus. Um, and if it's all about goals, um, then um, I think, you know, the, we can deliver as we promise, and we can do it in a way if we're matching the time horizon of the investments to the cash flow that's required, then it, we're in a, a good position to hold things until they're actually making money and avoids a situation of having to sell something unexpectedly at a loss. You had a question? Yeah, yeah I'm curious. Did you build the software to do this reporting in house? We, or we, we did. We built the software uh, to do this. Uh, in-house, yeah, um, but we did it on a Adapar platform. So if you're familiar with Adapar, we, we have programmers that use, can program in Adapar and do it, did it that way. The other thing we can do is because we're categorizing assets generally as uh, in our security master, we can categorize them as lifestyle growth or aspirational assets. If a prospect comes in and, you know, and says, here's, here's my portfolio, we can actually give them a, a relatively rough assessment, but we can say, here's how you're allocated on a lifestyle growth and aspirational, and take them out of the stocks, bonds, and cash con, uh, conversation. Um, okay. Um, the last point I want to make, is, and this is really, it's all about matching the risk profile uh, of the assets to the cash that's needed when it comes due. So, and, I, and, now I, and you all know this, you wouldn't invest in any equity or any portfolio of equities unless you had at least a seven to 10 year time frame um, to allow that to kind of percolate and play out. But one thing that I think people don't realize is they do tend to focus on return and not as much on risk. And risk, I think, uh, is vitally important. In fact, in what I'm showing you in this case, it's more important uh, than return in this case. So what I'm showing you here are two portfolios. Um, and you can see the yellow portfolio has an annualized return of 8 point. They actually both have the same annualized return, 8.1. Uh, the yellow one is a standard deviation of 7.4. And the gray is a standard deviation in 19.6. And why this is important, it's, you know, as your dollar cost averaging, as a young person, your dollar cost averaging, you want as high uh, a volatility as possible. It allows you to, to buy the dips, if you will, right? So you want the thing to really swing around a lot. And so, and that's why with an aspirational portfolio, we actually want to have a fair amount of just you know, high risk, high return rifle shots. Um, but when you're in a position of drawing on your portfolio, which is essentially the opposite of dollar cost averaging, then, you, then risk works against you, right? Then it's forcing you to take money out at the wrong time. And that's what, that's what uh, clients tend to do. So if you look at the portfolio value, these are both uh, $5 million portfolios where we're drawing $250,000 per year out of that portfolio. Um, they both started out with the same amount, with the same return, and you can see that gray portfolio by year, what is that, four, um, is now trailing the yellow portfolio by near, nearly $2 million out of a $5 million initial starting value. Um, and even by the end, it never makes its way back, right? It trails by about a million and a quarter or so um, 
at the end of 10 years. And so, um, the, you know, I, I can't emphasize enough how, especially where you've got clients who are drawing on their portfolio um, to meet their lifestyle needs, how matching that risk of cash flow to the investments is, is critical. Um, just another thing, we just, here's our portal. And um, we have, here's why you should sell your firm to us. <laughs> and our disclosure, we actually have two pages, of, um, one page of disclosure. Anyway, so with that, let me stop there and open it up for any questions that you have. Yes? No. So um, Jack, you, while, you the that? question is, are we, are we just living off the income on that lifestyle portfolio, or are we living on lifestyle and principal? Um, gen well, it is a high, we are maximizing the income. So we do have a 6% uh, income portfolio um, and a, you know, like I said, a pretty principal st stable portfolio over a three-year holding period. But I will say we're pretty indifferent on whether we're spending income or principal. And then we use the, the growth portfolio. It's sort of a waterfall. We use the growth portfolio to fund lifestyle uh, as, you know, as there are opportunities to do that. Yes? Did y'all model what type of max drawdown y'all could see in the lifestyle portfolio? Um, yeah. Um, so we have, uh, we do have it. I don't have it in, you know, by heart, um, but if, if you send me an email, I can get it to you. But we have a, um, it, it is a, uh, I'm trying to think, it, it's, you know, our, our, if you run a Monte Carlo and do 10 percentile, it's, it's not that far off. I mean, it's, it's maybe over a three-year holding period, it's like 11% or something like that. It's like an outside, you know, extreme case. Um, over one year holding periods, that's different. Because um, I used to, when I was at BMO, I had a very similar portfolio. And I will say in 2013, uh, that portfolio was down 13 11 to 13%. And then we got it all back the, the, in 2009. So 2008 and then 2009, we, we got it back. So starting in 2008, ending in the end of 2009, it was back above where, where it started. Yes. Two questions. I'm not sure I'm understanding your goal here. Are you offering to sell your software and services to us, or what is the purpose? Of so that's a great question. I'm not here to sell you anything, quite honestly. I don't mind if you are. No, no, no. Um, no, what I'm trying to do, uh, it's, um, I'm actually not. Um, my, my job is to make you aware of this, um, or suggest that I believe, because I, I felt so strongly about where this is going, that I helped start a firm that does this and left a firm that wasn't doing it. Um, and I really do believe that RIAs have a, a unique advantage in migrating to this much faster than the largest. Uh, so we, I'll give you, a, here's another testament to this. So we started, in, we started essentially in January 2018 with zero assets under management. We're now over $4 billion, okay? Most of what came over was from bulge bracket banks. Uh, and if you offer this notion of actually building a portfolio, it, it, makes, it just makes intuitive sense to a lot of people that really don't want to worry about this stuff. Well, to that, to that point, just to let you know, I was with UBS until May of last year, and UBS actually, the last conference I was at was rolling this out last May. So the big wires are doing this now as well. With right. But at the same time, all this talk to mitigate risk and, and maintain lifestyle, why not just use a VA where they get guaranteed 5 6% for life and never run out and risk all, or transfer the risk to the insurance company? Like why even mess with that when you can achieve the same thing right. and, and not to worry about it? Yeah, no, I, I think there's certainly um, something to be said for that. Um, you know, if, um, you know if, if you can find a variable annuity that can achieve your goal and lock that in and then take whatever else uh, is left over and then 
pursue a much higher risk strategy. I mean, that's part of the same thing. I think that, um, you know, when you start getting involved in product and you have been, you, you know as well as anyone at UBS, I mean, there are a lot of mouths to feed along the way. Um, and so, and I live in Palm Beach. I see where all the hedge fund managers spend their fees. They're all on oceanfront properties along the perimeter of the island, right? So, so I, I get it. I think there's just a lot of slippage. And if you can build this yourself, I mean, I'm not saying we're managing, you know, we're finding managers and doing different things, but um, it's really not that complicated to actually build this out yourself. Uh, and I used to, in fact, my first portfolio manager job was at an insurance company. I was the guy taking that risk. So, so one more question. It. Yeah, one more. Yes. That's. We're reinforcing market performance and allocation, even though we might tell your clients this money is allocated to this kind of almost a bucket. Right. Are you aware of software that's out there for independent advisors? Uh, I'm sure there's. I'm sure it's coming. You know, the fact is, what I'm telling you, and you realize this, it's nothing new. I'm not. I didn't invent this. I've known about the, the gold space investing for five or six years. I would imagine something is going to come along. I think short of that, um, because one of the plan Bs I had in the event that we couldn't get um, a, a, a um, gold space reporting package in place is, I mean, I don't know, it may sound kludgy, but you could literally just set up three separate portfolios in your clients. You could have set up a, an account that's a lifestyle portfolio, an account that's a growth portfolio, an account that's an aspirational portfolio, and then sort of report on it that way. Yeah, the challenge is just to be able to roll chart. Money has shown your progress for your goal. And yeah. That's what we want to have on a report, but I can't do that. Yeah. Or at least I can't find it. Right. So that's, um, yeah, no, we built it, but it's probably, if you wait around, I'm sure it'll, somebody will invent it. So anyway, thank you for taking the time. Um, for those of you who want to get um, the report, the, the, the presentation or get our research. I write a re, like a macro piece once a week and then a, uh, a monthly um, kind of an overview thing. Um, feel free to give me your business card and we'll include you in the list. So thanks very much. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider or via questions at the options insider.com.